True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht and you're listening to a Spotlight Minisode in which we discuss cases that are in the media at the moment and related topics. This week, I'm going to be using this mini-sode to wrap 2022, and remember some of its best, worst, and other memorable moments. Before we get into that, I need to catch up on thanking our awesome new Patreon subscribers who've joined the platform to support the podcast recently. A huge thank you goes out to Alexandra C. Osborne, Michaela Koka, Ahmed Badat, Meg Dusa, Lexi King, Lisa Marie, Anandale van der Merwe, Shafiq, Sonia Faree, Almin Kutsia, Sharon Rogers, Nosipo Mtlanga, Deirdre Allen, Hester Kutsia, Natalie Shawneen Brown, Richard Anthony Shamali, Rufaro, Deirdre Taylor, Francois Bezadenhout, Monet Oulifier, Renelle Lombard, Lizé Lowe, Samantha Donay, Wendy Breitenbach, Hannah Ashley Stephen, Quena Fortunate Matcha, Yolandi McCarthy Duplessis, Vanessa, Alyssa Foree, Charisma Mahabir Pala, and Nicole Gerber. Thank you so much for your support, everyone. It really does make a huge difference. This episode releases on the 23rd of December, and if you're one of those people who like to leave gift buying to the last minute, Consider that you can purchase an annual subscription to True Crime South Africa's Patreon channel for as little as $1 per month. With the subscription, you'll be gifting your best true crime friend, or yourself, an extra exclusive episode every month, add free versions of every episode, and additional extra bonus content that I tend to add whenever I have it, like the recordings of my most recent book launches. I think it's a pretty good deal considering it costs less than a loaf of bread per month. You also get access to all the episodes and other content that's already on there, so that's your festive season listening sorted. So, 2022 is almost done, and what a year it's been. We've had some pretty awesome moments together this year, and although many listeners do follow along with all the podcast news and my personal work stuff on social media, I know a lot of you aren't on there, so I wanted to start this year's wrap-up with a rundown of some of the cool stuff that's happened this year. In March, I was invited to speak at an insight session for the Interactive Advertising Bureau, or IAB, South Africa. I was asked to speak about my journey in podcasting and why I think that True Crime South Africa has been so successful in such a short period of time. The recording of this talk is available on YouTube on the IAB's channel. What I shared with those present, who included members of Spotify's management and other pretty important people to the podcasting world in South Africa, is the power of stories and how listeners and brands have figured out through True Crime South Africa that they can indulge in a genre that intrigues them, while simultaneously being part of something that's really making a real-world difference. I spoke alongside South Africa's most successful podcaster, Mac G, the host of the hugely popular podcast and chill show. At that time, he was second only to Joe Rogan on Spotify's SA Charts, and I joked with him that I wanted to see him in that top spot. And sure enough, a few weeks after, he knocked Rogan off his perch. In April, I launched my new podcast series, I Lived Through This. I got the idea for the podcast after having the privilege of of listening to so many people tell me their stories, and starting to realize the deep value of that process, for the storyteller as well as the listener. I also know very well that there are a lot of people out there who can't listen to true crime on a consistent basis for mental health reasons, and they need something a little lighter as an in-betweener. In I Live Through This, 
The survivors of many different types of situations tell their own stories, with me narrating in between. I've had the pleasure of speaking with some truly amazing people on that podcast, and the launch is definitely one of the highlights of the year for me. I haven't released new episodes on there for a while because I've been working on other projects, but I do have some new episodes coming up, and I'll be getting back into that as soon as possible. In May this year on True Crime South Africa, I released an episode called The Missing Updates with an exciting announcement. The exciting announcement was a song that was written and performed by Jesse and Alyssa Zhao. Alyssa and Jesse are the niece and nephew of Desiree Reed, who this year has been missing for 22 years. We cottoned on to the idea of them writing a song about the aunt they never got to meet and missing people in general, and the talented teens created the song, Void. The song is simply incredible, and it truly was one of the most special moments of the year to be able to share it with all of you. I'll be using the song as the soundtrack for future missing person cases, and I think it's going to be a really meaningful addition to those episodes. In that episode, I also mentioned some leads that had come in on some of the missing person cases. And honestly, these leads, and one that's come in on a cold murder case I've covered, have been the most incredible result of the podcast that's happened so far. That really is what it's all about. And I can't wait for that to happen even more often. Also in May, the continent celebrated Africa Day and Spotify's selected True Crime South Africa as one of just six podcasts from the whole African continent to be promoted on their digital platforms for a three-day period in celebration of Africa Day. In July, the PR campaign for the Showmax Devil's Dorp documentary, for which I created the official companion podcast, won a Gold Prism Award for Best Arts and Entertainment Campaign. These are awarded by PRISA, the Public Relations Institute of South Africa. In August, I flew into Johannesburg for a whirlwind 24-hour trip. The purpose of this trip was twofold. I was being interviewed on Jacaranda FM, and that interview coincided with the launch of a new Jacaranda FM true crime project. Jacaranda chose six episodes of the podcast – and translated them into Afrikaans. Well-known breakfast news presenter Gerda D'Souza was chosen as the host for the Afrikaans version, and True Crime South Africa, the Afrikaans of Yehava, was launched. It became hugely popular, and instantly shot up the charts. I really loved this experience. Meeting the Jacaranda team was really amazing. They are a very cool bunch of people. And I just love the fact that more people are getting to listen to some of these stories in their home language. I'd really like to be able to do this in all of our official languages. So if there are other radio stations out there who'd like to partner with TCSA to serve their specific language audience, reach out and let's make it happen. On the 25th of September, True Crime South Africa won its first award ever for Best Crime Podcast in the inaugural awards event of the African Podcasters and Voice Actors Association. And later that month, the Devil's Dorp podcast won a gold award at the New Generation Awards for Best Use of Podcast. October was a pretty incredible month for me, as it marked the release of my first published true crime book, Samurai Sword Murder, The Mornay Haramsa Story which was published by Melinda Ferguson, an imprint of NB Publishers. And this dream come true happened as a direct result of the podcast, because Melinda heard the episode I'd done on the case. The months that followed have been a flurry of interviews, launches and signings. I've met many True Crime South Africa fans in person, and realized that I really like doing live events so I definitely want to do more of that in 2023. Samurai Sword Murder is available in paperback in bookstores and online as well, and also in ebook format on Amazon and now in audiobook too on Audible. In December, 
we reached a pretty major milestone on the podcast with the release of episode 100. I honestly cannot believe that I've covered 100 cases. It seems absolutely incredible, and it's been a really cool way to end off the year. As part of celebrating that milestone, we had a really amazing giveaway sponsored by Touchpoint South Africa, and this past week, we gave away four sets of Touchpoint devices to four lucky True Crime South Africa listeners. Next up in the episode 100 celebrations is going to be a giveaway of two signed copies of Samurai Sword Murder, so keep an eye on social media for that. Breaking down this year like this is quite overwhelming, actually. It's been a little insane, I won't lie. But it's been absolutely incredible, too. And I cannot thank all of you enough for your amazing support and cheering me and the podcast on throughout the year. I'll be honest with you. The public stuff still weirds me out a little bit. In fact, I don't know if I'll ever get used to it, because it's all happened so quickly. But I know that every time I do an interview or an event, what it does is bring more eyes and ears to the cases I discuss on the podcast. More people know about the victims of violent crime in South Africa, especially the ones with unsolved cases. So that's what I focus on when the public gaze feels a little intense. I've got a few things booked already for next year. I'll be doing at least three book signings in January and early February in the Western Cape. In late February, I'll be doing a book event in Clarence. And in May, I'll be speaking at the Kingsmead Book Festival in Johannesburg. I'll provide more details about these events and more in the new year. Now, last year, I released a blooper reel. And I only realized toward the end of this year that I don't have any bloopers saved for you. Now, that's definitely not because my recordings have been perfect this year. I just think it's been so rushed and busy that I haven't even thought about saving some of my funnier moments. Last year also included quite a few blooper entries from my pets. Sadly, as I've shared previously, two of my dogs passed away last year, and I can't believe they've already been gone for a year by the time this releases. My one remaining boy, Chum Lee the Beagle, is blind, and I think I've figured out how to record around his occasional moaning and groaning that the mic might pick up. One keen-eared listener did pick up his snoring in an episode, which I didn't even pick up until they pointed it out, but it's in there, and always will be. The only other non-human entry into recordings this year was the wild bird I've called Murphy, so that I have a name to swear at, who seems to enjoy singing at the top of his birdie voice as soon as I hit record. So that has been the year from a podcast and personal perspective. But what about the year in true crime in South Africa? Well, I think one of the happiest moments happened quite recently, when President Cyril Ramaphosa eventually put pen to paper and signed the CO Bill into law. The CO Bill basically makes it illegal for any convicted offender to be released by the Department of Correctional Services if their DNA has not been taken and entered into the database. It also means that a date will be set for DNA to start being taken from already convicted offenders, and this will hopefully see many resolutions of cold cases and DNA samples from crime scenes being matched up with incarcerated offenders. We've had some convictions of a few really prolific rapists this year, including one man who pleaded guilty to over 90 rapes and was active for almost a decade. In February this year, one of the strangest and most tragic cases we've seen in a while sprung into the headlines. 13-year-old Jeroban van Vyck was found murdered and dismembered on the property of a Clava resident, Daniel Smit. It's alleged that Smit had caught Jeroban and a friend stealing fruit from a tree in his garden and the man had chased the boys down in his car and caught up with Jeroban. 
What happened after that is a matter of an ongoing legal process, which is really yet to even begin, because Smith is still waiting for a bed in a psychiatric facility for a psychiatric assessment. Besides the clearly horrific murder, Smith added fuel to the fire by claiming he'd been part of some sort of murderous cult since he was a teenager, and that he'd killed four people in Seapoint many years before that no one knew about. Earlier this month, a single article was published regarding an ominous find at the property of Daniel Smith, which has been sold since he's been incarcerated. The article alleged that a metal drum that came from Smith's property was transported from Clava to Fredendal, and when it was cut open, a very bad smell came from inside the drum. It's yet to be confirmed whether the drum contains anything of value to a criminal investigation. If it does, of course, it will be interesting to hear how this was missed when the property was searched. For two Clava families, the discovery raises far more serious questions. There are two missing person cases in small-town Clava that remain unresolved, and both are from 2019. Eight-year-old Geneva Diergel and 28-year-old Janine Bottom both disappeared in that year, and they've never been found. Geneva's case is made all the more distressing for her family because the child was paralyzed, and as such, there's no doubt in their mind that she was purposefully taken by a predator. When the news first broke that Daniel Smith had been arrested and accused of the murder of a teenager, both the families of Janine and Geneva wondered whether he could be responsible for their loved one's disappearances too. If the new discovery is in fact verified, it'll take some time to determine whether the remains are human and whether the DNA matches either of these cases. We have a huge problem with space in psychiatric facilities for legally required assessments in this country, and in early December, Smith was number 93 on the list for his assessment, so it could well be another six months before he's even assessed. I'll definitely be keeping my eye on this one, though. In March this year, I released a mini-sode about a trial that was ongoing at the time, which is something I don't usually do, but I made an exception in that case because the victim's family had reached out to me and asked me to do so. The mini-sode was called Here's Your Outrage, The Murder of Dora and Rory Sang Matseme. The title came from the defense attorney in this case, having told the judge, in front of Dora and Rory Sang's family, that the defendants should be allowed bail because the low number of people present in the courtroom indicated that the community was not outraged at the crime. This completely ridiculous statement thankfully did not get his clients bail at the time. Dora and Rory Sung were mother and son, with Rory Sung being in grade 11. The pair were murdered at their home in, in the Orchids Pretoria in 2019, and the suspect standing trial for their vicious murder included school friends of Rory Sung's. So as not to do damage to the case at the time, I included only information that was in the public domain. In case you missed my update on social media a few months back, I can confirm that all four defendants in this case have been found guilty of two murders and robbery with aggravating circumstances. Three of the offenders were handed down two life sentences each, and the fourth, who was a minor at the time of the crime, had to be sentenced under the Child Justice Act and was given 25 years for each murder. Despite there having been a ton of really cool things that have happened this year, It's moments like this that really make everything worthwhile. The awards, the books, the other stuff is all cool. But it's this. A family receiving justice and some form of closure after not only experiencing the horrific loss of two family members, but then also being further traumatized by the system and the tiny role the podcast got to play in making their journey a little easier. This is the stuff I'm here for. A case I've been following for a while now was resolved this year as well. 
Korea criminal Moidian Pangakar was found guilty of the rape and murder of eight-year-old Tasne Van Vek. I'm sure you'll remember me discussing this case in several minisodes, and I also mention it in my book when I talk about parole. Pangakar's reign of terror has been lifelong, and I really want to delve deeply into this case at some point. I have recently been made aware, though, of some changes to the law regarding reporting on crimes involving children, and this may end up changing how I'm able to talk about such cases, both on the podcast and in future books. I think that once I've got all my legal facts in a row, I'd like to do a mini-sode on these changes to explain how they impact reporting and why they're important for both child victims and minor offenders. This year, mob justice came into stark focus when a young e-hailing driver, Abongile Mafalala, was murdered by a crowd of people in Grassy Park. The man was mistaken for someone involved in alleged child abductions, instances which to this day have never been proven to have even happened at all, and he died the most horrendous death for absolutely no reason. A large number of people from that community were arrested and bail hearings have been ongoing with no date set yet for a trial to start. As is the case in many mob justice attacks, this incident, or at least parts of it, was filmed on someone's cell phone, and that recording is going to form a large part of the evidence against many of the accused in this case, as they're shown directly assaulting Mafalala, which ultimately led to his death. Two people are also accused of collecting Grassy Park residents in their vehicle and bringing them to the scene so that they could participate in the assault and murder. I think that when this trial gets going, it's going to be a very important one in South African law for various reasons. Firstly, it's going to very clearly display why mob justice is so absolutely dangerous – and how, probably on most occasions, the victims of these types of attacks are actually innocent. I do tend to think, though, that the defendants are also going to present another side of this matter, and that is what has led to such incidents of mob justice occurring more and more frequently in South Africa. Mob justice is generally more prevalent in countries on the African continent. According to the Institute of Security Studies, or ISS, at least two people per day die as a result of mob justice incidents in South Africa. In countries where mob justice is prevalent, there is also a clear lack of trust in the police and court systems. In a survey conducted in 2018, 66% of South African respondents said that they did not trust the police and 46% said that they do not trust the court systems in our country. This, I think, undeniably plays a role in the prevalence of mob justice, although it certainly does not justify killing an innocent person. Another interesting observation by the ISS is that mob justice tends to become more prevalent in countries and communities where residents have become desensitized to violence. It's almost like a child growing up in an abusive home, where every problem is resolved with physical abuse. They are very likely to become adults who do not have the tools at their disposal to resolve any issue without violence. So I think that the trial for Abongile's murder is not just going to be about the criminal action of a group of people against an innocent and defenseless man, which in itself is horrific enough. It's also going to be about the societal issue of a community who's been exposed to so much violence and so little legal justice that violent resolutions have become the norm. Another long-awaited case that finally saw justice this year was the murder of Jessie Hess and her grandfather Chris Lottachan. Jesse and her grandfather Chris were murdered in 2019. Soon afterwards, a relative of Jesse and Chris, as well as his friend, were arrested for the crime. This year, 
David van Boeven was found guilty of the murders as well as other charges, including the sexual assault of Jesse, and he was handed down two life sentences. His accomplice, Tazleen Ambrose, was acquitted of the murders, but found guilty of participating in the robbery of the victims. Van Boeven was out on parole when he committed the murders. I'll definitely be covering Jesse and Chris's case in a full episode in the new year. Of course, I cannot let a wrap of the year go by without mentioning the awesome people I've got to interview this year. In March, I chatted with Renal Kukumud of Rape Crisis Cape Town Trust. In a fascinating interview that defied the load shedding I was experiencing at the time, we discussed the amazing work that Renal and Rape Crisis does and we delved into a pretty deep discussion of consent, including consent within relationships, which I thought was a pretty important discussion. I then had the distinct pleasure of speaking with Dr. Lisa Grobler, who is a criminologist and expert on the numbers prison gangs. That is definitely one of the interviews I did this year that really changed my perspective on a lot of things as I realized how many crimes we think are not gang-related at all, but are actually deeply impacted by gang relations and customs. I had quite a bit of feedback from that episode with people reaching out to me to discuss their own personal experiences with members of the Numbers Gangs. Some of the best interviews I've done to date have been the ones that didn't end up going along the lines I'd anticipated. I think it's important to be flexible when you go into interviews, because often you'll start a conversation that wasn't part of the original plan, but it ends up being far more valuable than what you'd actually intended to cover. This was the case with my interview with Colonel Kirsten Clark of the SAPS's Investigative Psychology Unit. I'd intended to discuss a general overview of her work and the unit, but ended up discussing one specific part of her work, which is super relevant, digital sex crimes. That interview is important to anyone who engages in the digital world, at all, even if you don't think your sex life will ever cross over into the digital realm, because as Colonel Clark explains, sometimes the choice is taken out of your hands. Then I had the privilege of interviewing Dr. Hestelf and Stardom, a forensic pathologist and the star of the television series Autopsy. That interview was incredibly interesting, and I'm so glad I got to connect with her style. She's currently writing her first book, which will be out next year, and I cannot wait for it to be released. I'll definitely be interviewing her again when that's out. Her style is a perfect representation of what I see in many of the people I interview. She's an absolute professional, and she is also deeply passionate about what she does. Her work often contributes to justice for victims of violent crime in South Africa, and even when the autopsies she does are not related to crimes, the closure she provides families with is absolutely invaluable. I was actually connected with Hestel by another interviewee in 2022, Dr. Gerard Labaskakni. I interviewed Dr. Labaskakni for the second time on the podcast when he released his book, Profiler Diaries 2, and then I was interviewed by him too. I had the distinct honor of being in conversation with him at the launch of my book in Brooklyn, Pretoria, and he also interviewed me on his podcast, Profiler Africa, with journalist Paul Llewellyn. Through my partnership with CBS Justice, I was also able to interview Dr. Richard Shepard, a hugely experienced British forensic pathologist who's worked on some very high-profile cases, including the Hungerford Massacre, the inquest into Princess Diana's death, and many more. I really only got the chance to chat with this international professional because of CBS's support of the podcast, and they, along with all the other sponsors of the podcast this year, have made a huge difference in my ability to continue to bring you this content. In many of the interviews I've given about podcasting, 
I get asked about sponsorship and monetizing podcasts. And that's always a touchy subject for me. It was a really tough decision for me to accept that I would have to monetize True Crime South Africa in order to continue with it. I found it hard to weigh up the fact that I was talking about the worst moments in people's lives, and then somehow I also had to try and pay for the time I was putting into it. I think what's helped me to come to terms with this necessary evil, if you will, is that all of the people and brands that financially support this podcast do so with the spirit of wanting to be part of the positive outcomes. Yes, they're looking for traction for their brands, but really, they could find that anywhere. What gives me peace about the income that helps to pay for this podcast's creation is that all of the contributors are here for the same thing I am. Many of the brands have approached me because individuals in their organizations listen to the podcast, or they've heard that it's helping to bring in leads and bring resolution to the families of victims of violent crime. I know for a fact that everyone that belongs to Patreon does so because they too want to see the podcast grow and become an even larger platform for good. Whenever I align with brands, I only do so if I feel they fit what I'm here to achieve. I've actually turned down several pretty large campaigns this year because I didn't feel that the brand or the product aligned with the podcast's ethics. One of those instances actually ended up blowing up in the media later, and I was very grateful I'd followed my gut on that one and chose not to participate when asked. So I think that as long as I continue to choose sponsorships and partnerships with the podcasts and my personal values in mind, I can safely say that I'm not cashing in on anyone's tragedy. Will there always be people who will tell me that I am and that what I'm doing is unethical? Yes, I'm sure there will be, but I can't change that. I know that there is an impression out there that I do this full-time, and it's my only source of income, but it's actually not. I would love to be able to podcast full-time at some point, but at the moment I'm still doing several other bits of freelance work in addition to the podcast. So when you see me selling books, or asking for Patreon members, or selling merchandise, which will happen in the near future, please know that this is not me building a so-called empire on the backs of victims. The day that I no longer feel that this podcast is doing anything other than producing content and no good is coming from it, I will put down my microphone and walk away from the genre. In the new year, I want to have what might be an uncomfortable but important conversation. I'd like to invite survivors, the family members of victims, and content creators onto a panel discussion about the ethics of the true crime genre. More and more, we're seeing victims' families coming forward internationally to say that content being produced around the crimes their families have lived through is unethical and unhelpful. On the other end, some content creators are defending their work saying that they have the legal right to tell stories that are in the public domain and that it is in the public's best interest to know. I have pretty strong views about what is and is not ethical true crime content, but even I have been questioning parts of what I do and how I do it, and I think it's only fair to hear from all sides on this. The true crime genre is really just taking off in South Africa right now. And I think it's vital to start off on the right foot and have as many content creators on board with doing things the right way. Not everyone is going to toe the line, but if we can have the majority of content creators at least trying to do more good than harm, I think we'll be on a good path. And that is your wrap for 2022. It has been an epic, exciting, Crazy and sometimes maddening, yeah. But with your support, I got through it. And I cannot wait to see what next year holds for all of us. I'll be releasing one more full case episode before the end of the year, and after that, I'll see you in 2023. 
Don't forget to keep an eye out on social media if you'd like to stand the chance to win a signed copy of Samurai Sword Murder. Thank you for listening to the Spotlight Minisode, a wrap of 2022. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Lived Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.